Hello, and welcome to More Intelligent Tomorrow. A wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. Can AI help crack our genetic code? Will we ever be able to understand all three billion base pairs? We'll discuss this and more with David Burnick and Punit Bhatra today's episode. And now, your host, Ben Taylor. Puneet and Dave from the Broad Institute, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Good to be here. And so, who is Broad associated with? Are they associated with MIT and Harvard? Is it a co- combined effort of the two schools? Explain that. The origins are, are collaborative between MIT and Harvard involving the uh, Human Genome Project. And this is kind of the um, long-term uh, spinoff of the Human Genome Project. And what is the hum- Human Genome Project? What are the ambitions there? What's the what are the goals of the project? The human genome, uh, and I'm not a biologist, so I might get some of this a little wrong, but the human genome uh, is made up of lots of different um, acids, and they code for different genes. And uh, up until the human genome project, we did not have a full mapping of an entire human from beginning to end of all those genes. And it was an effort about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, to do that, and um, the output of it um, became essentially the broad along with other institutions. That effort to map the first genome finished around 2000-ish, and it was sort of, you know, like a major accomplishment, if we all remember, three billion nucleotides helping to to uncover kind of the information that's locked in our cells. And then I think after that, there was a recognition by um, the Broads, by MIT, by Harvard, um, and others, that to carry forward that information into curing of disease, there needed to be a multidisciplinary center which was really focused on how do you take that information and, and turn it into therapeutics, new research discoveries, et cetera. And so since that time, there's been uh, a lot of that work has been carried on at the Broad and other places. And for our listeners, I'd love for them to appreciate the difference between what was done 20 years ago and now. So 20 years ago, how much did it cost to sequence the full genome? And then what would it cost a listener today? If I was very motivated to go get this done, what, what's the difference in the effort needed to do that? So if we're talking whole genomes, I think what was the cost of the, the $13 billion to do the first one? Yeah, de- definitely up in the billions. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, now it's under $1,000. So that's one of the things that we're very involved in uh, is is how do we drive that price lower? How did it go from billions to now flirting with $100? What, what has been the main innovation that's allowed that to happen? From my perspective, it's been a combination of a few things. So first is just technology. There's been a lot of improvements over time driven by companies like Illumina, et cetera. And so a lot of it is scale. A lot of it is demand. A lot of it is industry innovation. And then a lot of it happening at the Broad, you know, in part uh, with our teams and David's team is figuring out how to computationally store that, you know, how to store that efficiently, how to compute on it, et cetera. So there's been a lot of sort of chips away at that over time. Puneet, it feels like you're kind of at the intersection of two crazy fast growing technology groups because you have artificial intelligence, and then you have genetics. And I'm sure if you talk to both groups, they'd say we're growing the fastest, we're innovating the fastest. I think a lot of times in AI, we feel that way. We're like no other tech sector is moving as fast as we are. Um, how, how do you how do you see that being in the middle? I basically find myself in every conversation feeling like I know the least about any of the subjects being discussed. So there's a huge number of people that are working on genomics, and it's accelerating really rapidly, and it's hard to keep pace with everything that's going on. Same on the ML side. I don't know about you, but you know the, the developments and architectures are amazing and quick, and figuring out how to, you know, I feel like we're a lot in the space of seeing what's out there and picking and pulling pieces that are relevant for our problems as opposed to, to learning it all. And then on the disease space too, you know, we're also, we're working with people that have studied cardiovascular disease for 20 years. And that's also a rapidly growing field, a rapidly evolving field. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think this isn't a question about who's moving fastest. Everybody's moving crazy fast. It's, I feel like a lot of what we're trying to do is tread water and pull the threads together. Maybe let's talk about some of the work that Broad is doing when it's trying to tie genetic insight to disease outcome. But one of the things that we find very promising, and this is a lot of our research, is if you take a person and you look at all the clinical data you have about them, it's really rich. A lot of it can be a computer vision problem because you've got, you know, an echocardiograph, a sonar map of your heart, for example. And you can take that data and you can look for measurements, how how much, uh, how big is somebody's left ventricle in their heart, say. 
And then you can compare that to their genome and you can see if the two are correlated. So are there signatures on somebody's genome that might tell you whether somebody is predisposed to a large left ventricle, which might predispose them to sudden cardiac death? So that's a lot of the name of the game at this intersection right now, using language models or computer vision techniques to read rich information, whether it's clinical data or um, various single cell assays, and then connect that back to the genome in the first place to understand what the connections are. And that's a very intimidating problem. I, I'm reminded of my classical professor perspectives where they'd say, this is an impossible problem. You have too many features. It's ill-conditioned. It, it won't correlate. And I think we've kind of put that to bed with natural language processing, where we see 5 million features. Um, what's your reaction to that? How, how on earth do you find a correlation when you have 3 billion different variables that could impact the inputs? Yeah, it, it, it's uh, another good point. I, I think what a lot of the work that's done, and usually this is the case, as you know, is you clean up the data on input. So you restrict to people that already have a disease so that cuts down the cases you're looking at. You restrict to regions on the genome that you understand pretty well so you're only looking at a small number of variants. So that scales down the problem. You don't just want to find correlation. You want to find causal paths and functional paths that you can turn into therapeutics. And I think that's really where a lot of the, the, the scientists at the Broad start to come in. Um, how do we actually prove that this is the variant that causes it, that this is the molecular pathway that ends up resulting in an enlarged heart? And then if we do that, is there now a therapeutic we can actually apply to it? So you kind of get the, the best and worst of all ML worlds. You have huge amounts of data that you've got to sift through on all sides, input and output. And then correlation is clearly not good enough because we're actually going to use this to intervene with people. That, that's fascinating. I can imagine a lot of false starts or hi uh, historical points where people have jumped for joy because of a correlation that has dramatic meaning. And then they find yeah. out through that testing. Is that something that comes to mind as you think in the past that, yeah, there's been some false excitement yeah. around correlations that weren't true? Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely the case. So, you know, my, my favorite one, at least in a clinical setting, is if you look for the thing in an ambulatory setting for what uh, is most related to somebody passing away in a hospital, it's whether they were admitted to the ER or whether the chaplain came to visit them in their, in their room. So those, those are clearly things that are not causal, but you know if you just sort of throw an unsupervised learning algorithm at things, that's what you'll find. The process of verifying in a clinical trial setting or um, whether or not something that you found is relevant to the disease or to helping the progress of disease, it's a, it's a really important um, process to not take lightly. And so actually going through these clinical trials is ultimately the gold standard for all of this. So, David, I, I really want to understand the security perspective, because may, maybe that's not something I would necessarily expect in a research lab. But at the same time, you're dealing with very, very sensitive data that has high consequence if there's a breach. So I, I'd love to hear more about your background and how you ended up with at Broad Institute. I was a startup guy in the late 90s. I got hooked up with a, a, a venerable website that didn't really exist before that called Slashdot. And we learned security on the fly. And I did a bunch of interesting startups for a while. And um, I decided to throw my head into healthcare. One, we lived in Boston. It was just all over the place. And two, I realized it had a big uh, a big gap in terms of large-scale computing, which I knew was on the horizon, um, as well as data security. We need to be able to give scientists real access to the data and not restrict their access to it, but at the same time, kind of keep a careful watch about what's happening without, of course, violating privacy and, and, and things like that. So it's a constant, delicate balance. We can't build a wall around our stuff and say no one can access this. The challenge is how do we give people access in the right way, in the right context, uh, without really restricting the science that can happen from the collab collaboration of all this kind of data. In your space, things aren't standing still either. So we aren't yeah, to a place where things aren't hackable. The, a zero-day exploit is just around the corner. So how do you stay up to date? That feels very intimidating today compared to the type of exploits that people were talking about 20 years ago. We build with the idea that, hey, a malicious user might be using this. Um, so what do we do about it? As opposed to saying, let's prevent malicious users. Um, it's a bit of a different approach. Our data is to be shared, just shared correctly. If things go wrong, they don't just impact you guys directly. They actually impact society's um, 
willingness to pursue these helpful technologies, right? So if right. there if there's a catastrophic breach or some ethical dilemma, that could prevent someone with a rare disease from getting the help that you guys are working on. Is that we're, we're fully aware that a real breach is existential, and yeah. um, I think I think you you opened up with the question of like this is this is odd for a research uh, institution to have such a, a a robust data security viewpoint. And the answer is I don't think we can do this stuff if we don't. Part of it is that we have government grants, and the government grants and other contracts we have stipulate having a strong security program. It's it's part of our requirement. Now it's very explicit as to the level of security that you have to have uh, to host and, and manage this data. How would you describe CRISPR to a lay audience? The idea is that it can be uh, used to uh, snip out very specific portions of DNA in a in a in a in a, in a real thing. Um, including in what's called the germline in the, in the sperm um, and, and propagate those changes downward. In general, how I think of CRISPR is uh, there are systems that have come from nature that we, that teach us very well how to look for and identify certain sequences of nucleotides in the genome. And so not only can we identify in DNA a certain section that matches a characteristic, you can almost program that character, that, that sequence of letters in there, like you're writing code, it can also now alter that as well. So you can go in and you can say, find me the region of the genome that has 14 A's, G, three C's, 15 T's, and flip the third A to a G. Is there a scenario long-term where it, people, this feels more recreational, where if I want some enhancement or if I want to try out this new ability, I could potentially CRISPR myself for a year and then revert back. It, will any of us be alive long enough for that type of flexibility to come? Or is that kind of like the singularity argument or the nightmare that we don't want to get to? I think a safe but bold prediction is that we can cure all single gene mutation human diseases in the next 50 years. And and that's a huge number because we right, have yeah. like 30,000 plus of these diseases, right? Like it's given the huge breakthroughs that have created CRISPR in the first place, it's easy to imagine that something like delivery is going to be a trivial problem to solve compared to that, but getting things into the body and getting them to be effective is very hard. I, I think about less in terms of um, uh, curing it once a person has these diseases to more preventing them from happening in the first place, almost like vaccinating your children against, your potential children against this disease. Well, if you want to prevent them, does that start to go down the Gattaca approach where why not just yeah, have a designer baby? Probably. That's why I say, that's why I just say single gene mutation diseases. And I just like kind of end it in that box. Yeah. Like that's one of those things that we can mostly agree on. And I think the thing that'll be interesting is it, we we don't have a global society with the same rules and ethics and laws. And so whether or not we do it, doesn't really matter. Some, someone, somewhere, you might even argue that the CRISPR babies in China, they, they've they already taken that step. And there are people who specialize in bioethics and the long-term ramifications of this stuff who I hope are uh, smarter and more wise and more thoughtful than I can be about it. And that's why I kind of put my stake in like the single gene mutation one. It's a, it's a safe one. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't require a whole lot of commitment or thought. Uh, I think we can all agree on it. We've sort of seen people starting to do do-it-yourself home COVID vaccinations, right? Like I saw, I saw some like, was it an Atlantic article where somebody paid a thousand bucks and got a kit and yeah. was like told to put it in the fridge and do some stuff. And well, th there's a around. show, it's called Unnatural Selection, I think on Netflix, where it's just like some hillbillies just doing CRISPR in their barn, trying to make their dogs glow. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so it's going to be out there, you know, but it's, science is hard and uh, there's a reason it takes a long time to get consistent results. How do you manage this data set? Because I, I've heard people say that 98% of DNA is junk. It doesn't actually go. It's not encoded into proteins. But there's probably a dot, dot, dot attached to that where we don't really know. And so um, what's your reaction to the, ju the junk DNA? Do you feel like you can throw away 98% of the analysis? Or is there a big question mark there where we don't know? You know, I think there's different parts of the genome that people consider. There's the protein coding part, which comes into exome sequencing, and then there's the whole genome. And in between there, a lot of that used to be called junk. I think now we understand that that has regulatory functions for the protein coding bits. And it's this extremely complicated process of how the DNA folds and it's represented in a physical structure that causes that to come together. 
And that is a lot of the excitement that's going on right now is can we take machine learning techniques that have been used to read large volumes of things and understand long distance relationships and apply them to the genome to figure out what's what's actually going on. So what, what are you excited about, Puneet? I've got two things that I've I think we're going to see in six to 12 months that are really exciting. So first, I think somebody's going to start to deploy and whether this is uh, totally kosher or not machine learning algorithms on something like an Apple watch to really predict imminent risk of disease or, or, you know, heart attacks or something like that. I I think we're going to see somebody really start to play with that. Um, You know, it's got to be tested. You know, I think there's a lot of questions about it, but I think we're going to start to see that. Um, The second thing is I feel like the machine learning community has had sort of a GPT and ResNet moment on web scale data. And we haven't quite had that on clinical data, but we've got everything we've need. We've got, we've got all the architectures we've got, we're starting to get all the data. These models cost about $10 million to train. So I think that's in the scale of somebody about to really go out and build one of these models aimed at, DNA or clinical data in a way that will be very, very um, provocative. I think we're going to see crossing of a threshold for prediction in clinical tasks like this, which really meaningfully make people sit up and take notice. The other thing that's making my head spin are all the things that could be predicted from a genome. So it's not just disease, yes or no, like a classifier. It's could you predict a face? Could you actually predict a heartbeat waveform? So your heartbeat waveform signature is different than mine. Could I just look at a genome and actually teach AI long term to to pull something out like that? Is that with both of those examples, do you think either one is doable, impossible or a big question mark on we we have to wait and see? Right now, we can look at an ECG and we can say somebody that has long QT syndrome, for example, one of the changes on an EKG. If we do a GWAS, we look on the genome to see what's related to that. We find I don't know what it is. 10 to 100 regions that might be responsible. So I think we're just at the point where we're saying, how do we connect the dots between these macro phenomena and region and multiple regions on the genome? So I'm chomping at the bit for you guys to hurry and go all the way to GeneCAD, where I can like design my pigs that fly. Is that not 50 years out? Is that 100 years out? When I hear stuff like that, I'm, I'm more excited about things like the, the human cell atlas, which we didn't talk about here which is more like, to me, as a computer guy, that's more the implementation, right? So DNA is a plan, and, and the, the human cell atlas is more of the implementation, which is a, a gathering of all, what is it, one trillion types, one billion types of human cells that can exist in a, in a human body, uh, mapping all of those out about how they work and how they express themselves and how they operate. And it's a project that, that we work on. That kind of thing, I think, w- will be more telling about how, what things should ultimately look like than the pure DNA side of things. There's a funny debate that happens uh, between couples where they'll say, oh, this bad trait of this, of our kid is you or you, where now you could actually answer that. You could say, well, this severe ADHD, it actually is you. No, we can, what we do in in that case is we say, oh, it's a de novo mutation. It comes from nowhere. It's just nature. It came from neither of us. (laughs) Just a point Finally, mutation. A rampaging child is is com- is from the Genghis Khan. In fact, yeah. Like <laughs> so how do we beat COVID? This is such a mess that we found ourselves in. How, how do we beat this? So there's this guy named Michael Mina who was uh, we talked to the very early part of the COVID testing stuff that we started doing in March. Um, who is a, another Twitter blue check mark guy? He's a, a professor at um, uh, the Chan School of Public Health over at Harvard. He really believes, and, and, and I personally hold this belief, that one of the keys to doing this beyond the vaccination stuff, and we might be even too late to do this right, is rapid at-home testing that isn't 100% accurate. That's enough of a surveillance test that everyone can take it once a week and know where they are and then isolate if they if this thing comes back positive. Um, and it, combine that with a little bit of tracing, we'll know we'll be able to pinpoint when these outbreaks happen quash them quickly and everyone else can kind of go on with their normal stuff so you guys have a really interesting boss uh broad yeah who just got poached yeah yeah but got how's that job. going uh it was it was cool like you know i i uh i knew about it a little bit before the the thing broke uh the news broke about it and and my reaction was um uh my action was like will ferrell and um 
in, in Elf when he's like, oh my God, Santa, I know him. <laughs> uh, like, you know, my wife, my wife kept seeing him on TV and was like, oh yeah, that's it. You know, that's Lander. Uh, you know, that guy we know. And it's like, yep, yeah, there he is doing his thing. So yeah, he's the, the new or will be the new secretary of science, I guess, for the U.S., which is really cool. What is your take on him in this role? What What is his background? What What motivates you and, insp- and inspires you having had him as a boss? I, I don't have a lot of Akira worship in my life. I've met some famous people. I'm like, oh, it's interesting. Uh, but Mandy Patinkin and Eric Lander are like the two that, that even, even though I have a good relationship with Eric Lander and I work with him, uh, and when we work together, it's always very nice and very cordial. It's difficult for me not to be like, oh, yeah. It, you know, that's, that's a huge deal that he's, that he's there and he's talking to me about stuff. And it's hard for me to get out of that. You know, a, a great th- thrill of my career has been when I got to go to DC years ago, uh, with him, uh, and, and, uh, my boss, Anthony Filipakis, um, uh, to the NIH to meet with Francis Collins and some others about a variety of topics. Uh, and data security was on the thing and he's like, Hey, just come, why don't you just come with us? And it was really cool to sit in a room with like 10 other people and talk to those, those people about, the future of data security and life sciences. This is actually good for the world. We're really happy that this is happening. And I think that's that's very genuine. You know, er- Eric is, I think, a very rare combination of one of the world's preeminent scientists, but also one of its preeminent leaders. I mean, shepherding the Human Genome Project through creating this amazing organization that's really got a true north of curing disease and the thousands of people marshaled behind it. It's a it's a quite an interesting and rare combination that I think we're lucky to have in government at this moment. In the future, five years from now, uh, Woolly Mammoth Petting Zoo opens up in Thailand. Taking the kids, yes or no? Yeah, as long as it's in an enclosure, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I think people do pragmatic things with cutting edge science, and not like, what if I can make a mammoth? I think they think, what if I can grow a liver so that people don't get liver disease anymore? And I think we see a lot of that long before we see any kind of like, let's make a mammoth. Maybe Hollywood's an important factor to educate society because we've complained that AI is moving so fast that society is naive. And a lot of the politicians are naive when it comes to rules and regulation. And it's probably true in in your space as well, where technically it's not illegal for me to make a designer baby. Is that finally, do we finally have some laws around that in the US? I know there was some catch up there. Uh, The laws always play very late catch up. Um, and are interpreted in ways that are both detrimental and beneficial. And uh, I I think um, laws ultimately end up when people rule on them, they ultimately, I think, reflect on what has already been happening. And so as long as we we cultivate a good culture of responsibility, the laws should ultimately reflect that. That makes sense. So David and Puneet, I really appreciate your time. I know we've had a lot of uh, interesting content come out of this that is very thought provoking for our listeners. So I appreciate you guys being on the podcast. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ben.